God kväll och välkommen till Trolling with Logic den 25 januari 2014. Klockan är åtta här i Sverige, sju GMT och två i östra USA. Vi är en live show på internet som behandlar ämnen som vetenskap, skepticism och filosofi. Jag är Mortimer och med mig som vanligt är Zulu och Kitsch. Och nu lämnar jag över till Zulu för allt det tekniska. And thank you very much for the lovely intro, Marty. And just to go over the usual kind of um, tech stuff. Uh, just you can call in at any time. We, just, uh, we, call, we take calls after about 30 minutes of the show. Um, just send a Skype contact request to Throne Will Logic. Send me a PM with a just general gist to your question, and we'll add you on in time. Also, the show is later uploaded to YouTube and iTunes. So if you call in, we are recording. So you grant us permission to use your likeness in the recording. And also, this show is public domain, and so feel free to share it, copy it, distribute it any way you like. We only ask that you link back to us as a courtesy. And just a very quick say hello to a kind of reduced panel. There's no Sheila this week, but welcoming back, Kitch. How are you doing? Hey, everybody. And Marty, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. All right, and we'll do a very quick introduction to our special guest. Um, we were scheduled to have the Northern Ireland humanists on, but they couldn't make it. So I uh, guess kind of came in at the last minute here. He is the president of the Swedish Skeptics Association. I'm not even going to try and pronounce the Swedish name of it. And Vetenskap och folkbildning. There you go. Hey! <laughs> and also he holds a PhD in archaeology, specializing in Scandinavian prehistory. So please welcome to the show, Martin, how do you pronounce your surname? Sorry. Rund. <laughs> That's a rundqvist in Swedish. Rundqvist. But you can say rundqvist if you like. Ah, right. So, like I say, welcome to the show. Or you can say runequest. That's even better. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we'll just start off with the usual kind of introductory, introductory question. So, like, how did you get interested in skepticism? What really kind I of... got I mean, I was bullied by postmodernists at my department when I was a PhD student. They oh. were very uh, sort of uh, arts wings, uh, humanities people, and uh, I was thrilled to find that there are people who actually like science uh, and who will uh, say that, well, that, that issue is no, no, there's no, no you're speculating about that because there's no data, yeah. which is, is awesome if you've, you're from a humanities background. All right. So how did you get involved in this, the association itself and how did you progress up to being the chairman? Ah, well, uh, a friend of mine sort of mentioned them and I started, uh, well, I, I joined and I got the quarterly journal and after a few years I started editing the quarterly journal and uh, another few years I got elected onto the board and for the past three years I've been the chairperson. Right. So it's, uh, it's a lively uh, association. All right. What's the kind of the day-to-day -day workings of the association? Well, what we mainly do is organize uh, lecture nights and um, skeptics in the pub, and we put out, as I said, the quarterly journal. But I guess what uh, is the most visible day-to-day -day thing we do is that we uh, uh, we write uh, debate pieces for, for the papers, and we uh, give out uh, annual awards, which uh, always uh, entertains journalists, because we have an anti-award where we tell people that they are full of shit. <laughs> And so, like, what's kind of the, is there any sort of like, you know, pseudoscience that seems to be taking hold in Sweden? How is the, you know, just the general population, so their attitude towards science? Well, the thing to remember about Scandinavia is that we are extremely secular. Um, just the, the general society is, is, has sort of left religion behind and uh, people will get really uncomfortable if you have make strong religious expressions either for or against a religious view and they don't like loud religious people and they don't like loud atheists either uh, but that of course means that creationism is a non-issue pretty much in Sweden and uh, we don't get religious people trying to um, uh, to dictate how uh, sex education should be done or anything like that I guess our the single biggest issue is uh, alternative medicine, where um, uh, there's uh, quite a lot of that. Okay, uh, Marty, can you, you might be able to fill Yeah, I, I don't know if I have much to add. I mean, sure, we do get creationists every now and then, but mostly they're not from around here. They, they're immigrants, uh, usually Muslims. Uh, but 
Yeah, other than that, I pretty much agree. The, there is quite a bit of alternative medicine and uh, stuff like that in general, you know, sort of new agey stuff. and the TV whole, shows about uh, spiritual yeah. medium. Yeah, and uh, there are these uh, oh, sort of ghost hunter shows seeing, uh, I guess, the rest of the Western world. Uh, we have shows like that being made in Sweden as well uh, by some fairly influential people in, in the media that used to do like talk shows and stuff like that. Um, Catch the but it's not the sort of thing that where the entire population will sit down to watch the ghost hunter no. show because they're sort of on, on more marginal TV channels yeah, and right. uh, uh, it's, okay. um, it's considered loopy I, I believe. It's yeah. not a mainstream um, belief that, that you can contact your dead grandma. No, I, I'm getting the same impression that there's a, there are very few people who take it seriously, but it's still something that gets heard and uh, clearly uh, is considered worth uh, giving airtime to. Mm. Well, I guess it brings in the advertisers. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, like in your own field of archaeology, what's the kind of common sort of uh, claims that you've had to deal with in debunking? Well, we've got a few um, um, fringe theorists in Swedish archaeology. Um, they tend to like archaeo astronomy, where you uh, look at how um, archaeological sites relate to, to celestial events. And I mean, that is on the one hand, a, a real uh, field of study where people are doing real archaeological work, but then we've got amateurs doing doing weirder stuff, and <laughs> we've got this one guy who, um, he's been doing it for like 15, 20 years, about this one site, which where he pretty much, it's sort of, looks a bit like Stonehenge, and he, it's, it's, He's uh, sort of camped out there, and uh, he will very aggressively push his views on anybody who shows up there. It's it's a bit like having somebody in an anorak standing next to Stonehenge 24/7 yeah. and, and yelling at people. <laughs> and like, have you ever gone head to head with some of these people, like just debated um, them or argued them, like some of the fringe archaeo or just anyone on the other side of the skeptics debate? Have you gone head to head with anyone? I haven't done it live, but I've uh, I've been engaged in quite a lot of sniping on on the internet and in the media. Yeah. Um, but uh, the one time that uh, <laughs> this guy, the one I mentioned, he wanted to debate me, and I said, sure, if you can get the media on it, because it's not worth my time to go across the country to sit in in, in a, a, a village hall in front of a lot of uh, in front of twenty believers. Uh, but uh, as usual, the the media. And, and fringe views. So he he makes the the local paper, but but rarely an, anything bigger than that. Okay, uh, Kitch, do you have any questions there? Uh, yes, there's a question from the chat actually. Uh, just trying to get the for some reason my, Skype has just decided to hide the chat on me. <laughs> um, there we go. It's NSA. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this one is from uh, Sh Shangori. Yeah, Shangori. Uh, everyone is part of the church in Sweden pretty much by default, what I heard, which is what he heard. Does, doesn't the government still give money to the churches based on the amount of people who are a part of the church? So even though... So even though they aren't, there aren't people in the church, the money still goes there. Well, um, in the year 2000, the, the, the Swedish state church was divorced from the Swedish state, so it's now just another religious con um, uh, organization, and this means that they are dropping um, in membership pretty fast. But also, the Swedish former state church has been identified as a main reason for Sweden being a secular country. Uh, there's a, a sociologist of, of religion, or a sociologist of atheism, really, whose name, whose name is Phil Zuckerman. And he studied um, uh, Danish atheism a few years back and put out a really good book called Society Without God. And he said that the sort of very rational and non... Um, 
uh, non-emotional uh, nature of the Swedish state church has led to people sort of staying in that organization but losing all religion. <laughs> but it's true that they still get some of these. Uh, and um, for me as an archaeologist, I'm kind of happy that they do because they pay for a lot of the upkeep of Swedish medieval buildings. Okay, Ketchi, any other questions? Um, not, not at the moment, sorry, my brain is fried. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, di we do have a troll, I think it's a troll in a way, saying, can you guys prove you were here three billion years ago? Well, actually, <laughs> I don't think any one of us claims to have been alive for three billion years, dumbass. <laughs> that, that sounds very new age. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Usually the estimates for where, when, when Atlantis was going is slightly later than that. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, um, I, how, how do you find like... I um, feel three billion years old. I was say one thing we've kind of commented on the show before is like how just skeptics are portrayed in the media. I mean, do you come across that because skeptics are always portrayed as being, you know, miserable, cynical kind of people? Well, in the mainstream media, no, we, we get pretty good press. Uh, we've got a lot of um, um, very uh, sort of mainstream uh, academics on our board and, uh, and sort of in our ambit. So, uh, no, we along with the media uh, mainly. Of course, there are uh, French publications that hate us and French movements that hate us. Uh, and um, <laughs> we've got this one guy who's who doesn't like us, he's a, he's a believer in astral travel and stuff like that. And he spends, or at least he used to spend, enormous amounts of time sort of reacting to anything we did uh, on his websites and sort of writing about us and stuff. So it was sort of like having a, a press officer working 50% of full time for you for free, only he's really uh, hostile to the organization. <laughs> but still, he, he, he also put out... Uh, of, um, uh, gave us a bit of, of, of um, visibility through his actions. Uh, but um, since we're not sort of, um, um, I mean, to be a skeptic in the U.S., you are in some sense uh, yourself a beleaguered minority, yeah. sort of uh, fighting against people with a lot of political clout. I mean, 50% uh, of, of uh, active U.S. Um, voters are willing to vote for the Republican Party. Uh, that would not happen in Sweden. I mean, the guy who is the prime minister of Sweden right now, is uh, he's on the, the most conservative party that is sort of politically viable in Sweden at all. And he endorsed Obama. He does not endorse the, um, the Republicans. So the most sort of hard-headedly conservative Swedish politician is, is not even on that half of the spectrum of U.S. politics. So, so our situation as skeptics in Sweden is very different. But I suppose you would recognize that from Scotland, a, a traditionally an enlightened country. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, well, we do have some problems, like there's like one newspaper, you probably heard of it, the Daily Mail. Oh, yeah, is, the Daily Fail. Yes, <laughs> which is kind of hardcore anti-science paper. Oh, yeah, they're, they're populist, basically. Yeah. Basically. Um, I mean, do you have anything like that in Sweden, like any kind of net, like mainstream media? That no, wouldn't no. say that at all. We're, our, um, um, kind of it's free version, stuff, basically. Yes, very much so. Yeah. And, and people who have a voice thanks to the internet, largely. I mean, uh, the, the people we're... Uh, warring with these days are people who, whose existence we would, wouldn't have known about uh, 20 years ago. Uh, Marty or Kirch, do you have any questions there? Uh, yeah, I, I guess um, I'll go, uh, go on to the questions about your particular field. Uh, you're an archaeologist and you've been having... Uh, I, I saw this Maybe, maybe that was the, the pre-show here, I don't know, I didn't watch it. Uh, you gave a talk about um, how there's more pseudo-history, pseudo-archaeology than uh, pseudo-bridge-building, for example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you could just give the, the short version of that. Well, uh, that's a talk that's on YouTube. It's about uh, Scandinavian um, uh, pseudo-archaeology, uh, pretty wildly construed. But um, 
archaeology is a field that anybody can sort of get engaged in. And that is a good thing because we, uh, we get loads and loads of interested amateurs doing useful stuff because you don't need a par particle accelerator to do interesting stuff in archaeology. Um, but um, then there's the question of how to interpret the results. And then you, you can get the really wild interpretations from academics as well. And that is because in the, the humanities, the sort of uh, truth criteria are fuzzier than in, for instance, engineering. Because every, anybody can see if the helicopter flies or not. You, you don't have that uh, in, in the humanities. So, so you, uh, you're very dependent on source criticism. And I argue that Occam's razor is extremely important in the humanities. That uh, don't don't stick bits into your uh, your interpretation that that you don't need to um, to account for the the evidence. But uh, we are in the same wing of the university as people who um, do literature studies and film studies and uh, uh, sort of the whole aesthetic part of the humanities. And with for them a uh, has a value of its own. And that, uh, of course, uh, spills over into archaeology and has been spilling over into archaeology at least since the 80s when postmodernism came along. Sorry, I'm back now. Are you going to have a question there, Marty? No, go, go ahead. If um, you... There was one thing, it's a claim I've come across a lot on the internet, and it's about the pyramids. You're probably groaning already. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've been contacted by uh, by a pyramidologist once. Yeah, yeah he was and interesting. The one claim I always get is it would be impossible today to build the pyramids. Is there any truth in this idea at all? Like no. I said, with all airborne technology, we can do the pyramids. So, what does that say something about how they were built? Well, um, it would be it would be easy to do it today. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, one thing I. I just thought of it, but I, I'm surprised I haven't thought of it before. Like, have you ever considered just how they stack um, cargo containers on uh, ships? It, yeah. would, it would be just as easy to to stack rocks, and well, those containers are much heavier than the rocks used in the pyramids. Mm, well, most of them, anyway. Uh, not not per volume. No, no, not per volume. No, that's true. That's true. Mm. But um, I should say that archaeology is uh, is not a science in the same way that chemistry or, or physics or astronomy is. That where it's, it's sort of for me to meet a Japanese colleague, if we can talk to each other at all, we won't have a lot to talk about because what I'm doing in in Sweden is completely irrelevant to her in Tokyo, and vice versa, because the archaeological record is so local and regional in its character. So. If you uh, into Indonesia, I can I can dig square holes and I can sieve the the dirt, but I'll be completely in, in, in capable of classifying anything I find and understanding anything I find. So um, the question is about Egyptian archaeology. Then there, there's a, a separate type of archaeology for that, Egyptology, and um, actually that's something you can study in Sweden, one of the departments, but uh, most departments, there's nobody who knows anybody about Egypt. All right. But like say, is that like one of the most common claims you get specifically for like kind of archaeology? That and probably the stone circles is probably another one. Yes. Uh, New Age people love stone circles and there's <clears throat> endless beautiful stories about them. Uh, there's even academic study of New Age offerings at stone circles. Right. So there's people collecting the, the, the stuff that hippies leave at uh, sort of Anasazi sites in, southern US, in the southern U.S. and stuff and writing about it. And um, um, a friend of mine, he was, uh, he was working, doing surveying with one of these uh, electronic surveying instruments that send uh, an infrared light pulse to measure stuff at one of the, the sites. I think this was at the Clava Cairns in, in Scotland. Oh. And um, there were hippies there, and it was a nice sunny day, and they were meditating and picnicking and stuff. And, and suddenly, this very angry hippie girl comes up to my friend, and she says, It's you! It's you, isn't it? You and your machine! And he's like, Sorry, miss, what? I've been tuning into the vibes for hours, and I've listened to it go beep, 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 
but it's you and your machine, right? So it's, it's the, the measuring instrument. Every time he took a measurement, it would go beep, beep. And uh, apparently this was the music of the spheres to, to, this, uh, <laughs> to this lady. But I are better than most people because they really care about ancient sites. Uh, most people don't really pay them much attention. So uh, um, I'd say that even though New Agers can have very strange ideas about um, archaeology, they are way more interested than most. Uh, we got another question from the chat, yeah. this one from an interesting name, Shemail. How is the GMO slash vaccine slash HIV denial hype in Sweden versus places like America? All right, uh, those are three. The GMO thing is uh, it's not very big. Um, it tends to be, if you're a health food nut, then you're likely to believe that GMOs are um, uh, are dangerous in some sense. But Swedes are pretty, Swedish environmentalists are pretty well informed about that. They tend, if you ask them, why don't you like gene modified uh, uh, organisms? Uh, and they will say it's because they're tailored for a certain type of um, pesticide. And we don't want uh, to, our crops to be tied in with Monsanto pesticides, stuff like that which is sort of uh, rational. Um, but it's not a huge uh, issue in Sweden. What, what was the second one this person mentioned? Uh, vaccine denial. Vaccines, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Yeah, we've got islands of vaccine denial. There's this, um, um, there's this pretty old uh, New Age cult in Sweden, um, sort of an offshoot of theosophy called anthroposophy. I don't think it's big in, in the UK or the US, but it... It's uh, one of um, Helena Blavatsky's old buddies, and a man named Rudolf Steiner, who started his own uh, New Age cult, and they s survive in Sweden. And they have this really strange uh, status in, in, in Swedish public life, that unlike other New Age been around a long time and have a lot of money, they're sort of respected, and they are anti-maxers. So... Um, in around where they have colonies, you'll get these outbreaks of measles and stuff. And obviously, the really good vaccines will will uh, sort of work in 95% of cases, and you don't know which 95%. So, uh, if you're uh, if you got bad luck and you're in school with a lot of uh, anthro anthropo anthroposophy kids, then you, you run a very heightened risk of of uh, getting these uh, preventable diseases. And of course. Uh, just because your your parents are uh, in uh, in a spiritual cult, you, you you shouldn't have to deal with measles either. And the third one, what was that? HIV denial, I think. HIV. Oh, I think that's not on the map in Sweden. Everybody knows how that works. Yeah, yeah, we have sex ed in school, so. Yes. Which, uh, seen as you're taking the chat room questions, there's a few more. Sure. Um, did Sweden? Okay, this one's. I think this guy's taking the piss. Did Sweden <laughs> really invent IKEA, or was it of alien origin? <laughs> just invented the piss off, of send, uh, pisses off assembling that shit. <laughs> well, uh, the cool secret behind IKEA is that uh, the E and the A are the initials of two extremely small villages in southern Sweden, where uh, Campra, the, the the founder of the the company, had his first. Uh, I guess factories. Uh, so uh, it's uh, an acronym for Ingvar Kamprad. Uh, what's the one? Emma Boda Agunnarud, I think. Two, two really small places in, in the, the Swedish highlands where nobody wears a kilt. <laughs> Uh, but of course, we, we make IKEA jokes as well. And um, when Swedes travel uh, globally and, and get a, a yearning for preserve and meatballs and lingonberry and jam and stuff like that, so, uh, IKEA is, is where we go. Okay, um, there's one more from Bad to Bits. How much does climatology research impact Martin? Thinking about prehistoric disappearance of the Big Lake, can't, rem can't remember the name. And foundation of Scott, uh, the Stockholm. Uh, the foundation of what? Stockholm. Ska, uh, Stockholm. Sorry, yeah. Stockholm. Oh, right, right. Um, well, we don't really think of it as climatology research, if, though it is sort of. Uh, quaternary geology is is uh, geology about the loose stuff that is sitting on top of bedrock, 
and uh, a classic um, field for Swedish quaternary geologists is uh, shoreline displacement because there used to be uh, a glaciation, the Ice Age, the Scandinavia was covered in a uh, three kilometer thick uh, sheet of ice and it sort of pushed a dent in the surface of the planet and since the ice melted off the the dent is rebounding and Sweden is rising out of the Baltic Sea which means that um, everything I look at professionally in, in archaeology is, is sort of sorted chronologically uh, uh, for, uh, uh, from old stuff on mountaintops to new stuff at the current shoreline so that's uh, that's really important um, but it only only partly has to do with has more to do with what, what the the bedrock is doing. Obviously, rock is moving um, independently of the sea level. So, if the the polar ices start melting in a big way, uh, which seems likely, then a uh, several thousand year old trend in Scandinavia of land coming out of the water will reverse or stop, and the shoreline may start to encroach back on. On land, so I don't re recommend anybody to to buy shorefront at the moment <laughs> until we can get a handle on the the CO2 levels. Okay, okay. another one. Oh, okay. Um, what uh, this one's from guest eight o nine one four three blah blah blah. That's a charming name. <laughs> yes, rolls <laughs> off the tongue. <laughs> Clearly an attractive uh, individual. Yes. Ah, oh, yes. Uh, a man of many digits. <laughs> what, are, <Ooh. laughs> what are some good resources for well-supported information about Viking Age Scandinavia? Scandinavia? Well, um, I'd say start at your, your uh, local university library because there, there you'll find uh, really good stuff. Uh, trouble is, Scandinavian scholars tend to view the Viking period as a Scandinavian phenomenon, so we publish in Scandinavian languages. Uh, of course, if you're in the UK, you tend to think that, um, well, no, the Vikings, uh, that there are a problem. They show up in 793 and, and uh, sack Lindisfarne Monastery and, and, and they uh, establish the Dane law. Um, so something I, I often have to explain to people is that Viking is not an ethnic term. You cannot sort of, um, it's a job, not an ethnic term. So nobody was a Viking all of their life because you were only a Viking for a few years when you were young and no women were Vikings. So we just um, think of these people as, as Norse people. But uh, good resources about the Viking period. Um, any library should have a reasonable handbook about them and uh, the, the Wikipedia article is, is okay. There's a... Uh, uh, you, you do get the, the Wikipedia article about Odin or Woden, the, the, the pagan god, to, uh, keeps getting um, chunks of text inserted from uh, people interested in video games. So they will explain the role of Odin in Final Fantasy VII. Uh, but um, I believe the, the editors of Wikipedia are doing a pretty good job of, of uh, shunting that sort of information over into uh, their own articles. Marty, do you want to come in with anything there? Uh, not at the moment. All right. Uh, Kitch, do you have any questions related to uh, Yes, actually, um, you said that um, vaccine denial was... Uh, you said there, there wasn't much issues with GMO or um, HIV denial, but I find that vaccine denial or vaccine hysteria is it's a bit of a... A bit, a bit, bit of a problem in um, Sweden compared to the others. Why, why is it? Why do you think it's just vaccine denial and not the others, or the other, the other crap? Well, because vaccine denial has been huge in other countries, so we got a pretty mild case of vaccine denial. But I mean, let's remember that Andrew Wakefield got into the Lancet. So, judge, just judging by that yardstick, you'd think that this, there's probably something to it. Uh, and also, there's something, people don't really know what a gene is, and um, they think that HIV is something you will um, uh, only contract if you uh, visit steamy sauna clubs, but, but everybody knows what, what vaccination is, and it's, uh, uh, I mean, most, most um, 
um, mentally healthy people will not easily stick a needle into a baby. That's, that's not something you, you, you like to think about. So it's easy to think that there's probably something nasty about that. They're, they're sticking a needle into my baby and injecting stuff that has something to do with illness in the kid. Of course, it's, it's easy to jump to the conclusion that that's a... And, of course, it's, it's been a long time since anybody in Sweden had polio. And uh, um, people have had the time to forget. I mean, if you ask anybody born in the 30s or 40s about vaccination, they will say, you need to vaccinate my grandchildren now, because they remember what it was like. Yeah. Okay, there um, are questions coming up about uh, chiropractics. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting because I actually, I've actually encountered that particular stuff, but I, I don't know how much of that is pseudoscience. Isn't it more like uh, there is some actual benefit to it, but the pseudoscience is that it's supposed to have other benefits as well? Or I, I haven't really looked into that. Well, the original chiropractic invented in the late... Uh, late 19th century, early 20th, was had extremely wide claims. This guy said that, well, well anything you suffer from is because your vertebrae uh, are, are uh, not aligned. I can right. realign your vertebrae and you're going to be fine. <clears throat> of course, most Swedish chiropractors don't make those claims anymore. Exactly. But if I understand the research correctly, what, what you can get out of chiropractic is a pretty good short-term relief for back pain. Yeah. But... Um, if you look in sort of in, in your calendar, how many days did I have back pain, then you won't get, get well faster uh, you know, using the services of a chiropractor. You just get relief from the pain. Um, but uh, I believe that uh, for back pain, chiropractors have a pretty, pretty uh, good reputation in Sweden, probably undeservedly good. But then there are uh, other weird... Um, uh, versions of chiropractic, like osteopathy and um, stuff like that. Uh, I remember, funnily, I, I grew up in uh, a slightly new agey home, and um, <laughs> when I started going bald in, in my 20s, <laughs> my dad said, well, you know, my osteopath, he told me, you should rub your fingernails together because that will stimulate hair growth. <laughs> you need to do that to keep them going bald. Uh, and then when I, when I met my, my wife, uh, she's Chinese, and I was introduced to her parents. They didn't like me being bald either. And Chinese people don't like baldies. So my, um, uh, my mother-in-law, very uh, considerately, she decided that she needed to do something about that. So she fed me uh, bald animals, as you do, because if you eat bald animals, then you will get hairy. Uh, so I got... <laughs> Sounds like homeopathy almost. No, no, no. This is traditional Chinese medicine. They've been oh, doing it for a thousand okay. years. There can't, can't be anything wrong with it. Uh, so um, uh, I had the snake soup, and I had, which was nice. The snake was nice, and, and I had turtle, and that was pretty nasty. It was more like this really old egg-laying hen that you'd boiled, in, boiled into submission without any salt. And, um, well, there's no way to repeat the experiment, so nobody knows how bald I would be today if I hadn't eaten the snake and the turtle. But anyway, uh, chiropractic is, um, I'd say, it's probably the most respected alternative medicine modality in Sweden. But few chiropractors will offer to cure cancer. Yeah. Okay. We're not going to ask that question. <laughs> he's, had it, he's gotten that more than enough the past few months. Uh, Kitch, there's a few new questions there in the chat there. Oh, okay, Grant. Uh, should legal, uh, this is from Mechanic 1C, should legal action be taken against vaccine denial and, under, and other harmful things, or would that be unjust even though it, was, it is helpful for real health? No, I think free speech is a good thing. I should think we should make, um, just make clear distinctions who's talking. So uh, that, that's something that the media, they have a responsibility not to, to give just anybody a platform on um, uh, health issues. A few years back, we had Dr. Fat in Swedish media. Every time they didn't have anything to put on the fly sheet, they would call Dr. Fat, and she would uh, make up something about how you could could cure cancer by by not uh, by not eating high, uh, carbs and eating fat instead. And they would put that on the fly sheet and be happy. 
Um, so um, I'd say to, to, to Miss Mechanic that um, uh, we should not curtail free speech, but we should be uh, we should train good journalists who can, can tell a good source from a bad source. Oh, okay. Uh, this is from another guest. Are you a member of the Swedish uh, Swedish Humanist Organization? Oh, excellent question. I, I'm, I was going to talk about that. I am not uh, because I don't care about meta metaphysical issues. So in other countries, skepticism and um, atheism or humanism uh, is very closely uh, allied, such as in the US. But in Sweden, we've got the scientific skeptics, and that's where I'm the, the, the chairperson. Uh, we, we only deal in issues that can be approached uh, scientifically. Uh, and then we've got the Swedish Humanists, which is also a very thriving organization. They're, they're even a bit bigger than us, and they're into the whole thing. They can organize a, uh, uh, a godless bar mitzvah for you, if you want, uh, or a, a godless funeral. And uh, my kid went to, uh, to godless uh, uh, confirmation camp uh, with them. Um, simply because they don't care about those issues. Uh, and, um, and Sweden is, is one of the, or even the, country on the planet where uh, religion has the least uh, influence in politics. So, um, my, my attitude would be very different if, if I was in Alabama. Right. I, I think that there's uh, the, this idea that skepticism and atheism have have something to do with each other it's uh, it, I, I agree that it doesn't really have to be that way I mean I, I I'm an atheist because of my skepticism but I don't really see the two as necessarily related yeah, I uh, it's it's like if I mean if religious people keep their mouths shut there's nothing there to be skeptical about so Really, there's there's no need to be uh, an outspoken atheist just because you're an outspoken skeptic. Yeah. And uh, with the Swedish cultural climate, people will think you're weird if you're an outspoken atheist. Um, yeah, partly I, because there's that. really there's really nothing to fight about, fight exactly. against in, in uh, Sweden. So, uh, but we sometimes get this uh, in the the Swedish skeptics. Shouldn't we be be harder on the religious people and? Uh, um, I think we, we are hard on them when they make testable claims. But I mean, if somebody's going to tell you that <clears throat> Jesus loves all the children, then that, I don't feel that that's a, an issue for, for scientific inquiry. No. But if, if, uh, if this person said, Jesus wants you to quit doing uh, your mammograms or taking your meds, then uh, we will be interested in the issue. You can ask the sure. two questions. Yeah, there's some silly questions coming in. <laughs> well, okay. Fine. Um, <laughs> is it high t uh, this one bought the bits. Is it high time that the Swedish learned that a sandwich requires two <laughs> slices of bread? <laughs> <laughs> like, well, uh, what do we have to learn about sandwiches? I mean, Sweden doesn't really have a cuisine. We only have a collection of food preservation techniques, but, but, uh, but we're learning. And I, I can assure this person that in my home, we are eating some excellent Chinese. Uh, this one's from Shemel. Does Rundquist and Martin Marvode peer up? <laughs> oh, right, right. That, that's our uh, libertarian um, um, online freedom party. Uh, I don't. I, uh, I vote uh, Social Democrat, Labour. And I keep my political views uh, to myself. Yeah. yeah, That's also a very Swedish attitude. Yeah. Many Swedes believe that keeping your uh, political affiliation secret is not a right, it is a duty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I don't see it as a duty. I just see it as uh, whenever politics comes up when skeptics, skeptics or atheists are talking about it, uh, it divides the audience because it's like pe people tend to think that, well, I'm a skeptic and I come to this conclusion, so, so should other skeptics. And when they realize that you can't think that way about politics, um, 
you hilarity with, ensues. With, yeah, exactly. And so we have uh, uh, people who can't post a video on YouTube without the comment section being full of people calling them Nazis or communists or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I decided to keep my political opinions to myself. Well, uh, traditionally in Sweden, it goes all the way back to uh, to the labor movement of the late eighteen uh, hundred. Yeah, a uh, sort of um, uh, a free association of people who, with the foreign common interest will traditionally be non-political and non-religious. Uh, so uh, that will be sort of in the bylaws of, of almost every Swedish association. I mean, the Swedish Dog Breeders Association is, uh, they have to spell out in their bylaws that we're not into doing religious or political uh, issues, yeah. which is kind of overkill, but um, <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> What was I going to say about that? Um, oh, never mind. Okay, um, Mechanic 1C again. That question relates to whether skepticism has to... Whether, sorry. That question relates to whether skepticism has to do with ed education. It seems to be more of a mindset, or is it something that can be taught? Because a lot of religious people just seem to keep their mind closed. That's... Uh, well, it definitely has to do with education, and critical thinking is a critical part of a good education, which is why uh, people in Alabama homeschool, because yeah. uh, they want to control their ki kids' access to information. I've, um, I've raised my kids to use the internet pretty much any way they like, only the, the computer they do it on is in the living room where everybody else is. So, um, uh, we're, we, we don't... Uh, police what sites they can go to, but we police the environment in which they use the computer at all. That's a good uh, idea. Yeah, it's worked well for us. And um, um, <laughs> um, once when my son was like 11 or something, he asked me, Dad, what is so wrong about porn? And I said, well, a lot of porn there's nothing wrong with. It's just that you're 11 and I think you'd be uh, feeling queasy if you uh, ran into it. So it's uh, something you will probably be very interested in. Uh, uh, at your age, I, I would simply avoid it. And he, he apparently accepted that reply. Uh, someone in the chat keeps commenting about how Swedish education is getting worse. Uh, I... I, I I have to say, I agree in some cases and disagree in others. I'd like to know more about that, if the person could elaborate. Sweden, Martin. <sighs> well, I think when, it com when it comes to math and science, the, the grades are going down. Yeah. That, there was a, a study published not long ago uh, that was pretty embarrassing but we're used to being at you know one of the best nations in the world and uh, I th we're we're dropping but it's not like we're um, way behind but also embarrassingly you only need to swim a very cold river to get to Finland where they're absolute top on the planet yeah, yeah. that's true that's so the, the I think the, the public feeling is that uh, Swedish school has been become too touchy feely. That yeah. uh, a generation of uh, of teachers have um, sort of been brought up with the wrong aims. And um, I, I I know people who teach at the, the Royal uh, Technical College in Stockholm, and they say that well we need to start every first semester with what used to be high school math, yeah. which is of course sad. Uh, for me, I, I teach as well, and. Uh, I guess what I can see is that um, many students are not great at writing, but I don't know if they were great at writing before either. I, I can't really tell. No, I, I, I guess we're just um, not, uh, we don't have the same requirements uh, in high school, I guess, uh, as other countries in some cases. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's, um, but but I agree. Writing is something that students have been getting much worse at, and uh, uh, it's it's true that um, we don't teach enough math in math class in high school. It's uh, we're focusing way too much on uh, arithmetics and basically, even when. Uh, 
Uh, well, I, I guess I guess I'll just leave it at that. Uh, we don't require people to take more math. Uh, there's a lot of optional stuff that I think shouldn't really be optional. But then also there's a problem of, of pedagogy as a uh, sort of evidence-based discipline because yeah. uh, if if there was a consensus about how to teach kids, then we would be following that consensus, but there's right. not. So uh, pedagogy is, is still very, uh, it's almost sort of on a Freudian level uh, if you start asking around about how t to do things. So it's, it's hard to find sort of a consensus to build your best practices on. Yeah, that's true. I think that's something you get nearly in every country. You know, there's always going to be people decrying education. As it's like someone in the chat room said, nostalgia was much better in my day. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Gandalf used to be much older. Yeah, day. <laughs> yeah exactly. Uh, that's something I've seen uh, with my contact with Chinese culture. Oh, uh, Chinese culture is obsessed with study. So kids will to, to evening school and to Saturday school and they yeah. will study like mad, but they don't turn into Einstein. They they become just, just ordinary folks. Yeah. yeah, stars, even though they get their childhoods ruined by this constant study. So uh, I'm pretty sure what we're lacking is not uh, sort of volume of teaching or volume of homework. It's uh, more qualitative than quantitative. Exactly. Uh, right, uh, Kitch, have you got anything there? You were quite silent. Um, so I was, just, I was just kind of absorbing all that because um, I don't really know much about Sweden or Swedish culture or skepticism in Sweden. So. Well, ask us anything. Martimer and I can, can tell you. <laughs> no, yeah. but I was thinking there, Kitch, kind of, um, have you noticed, like, you're doing a PhD, are you noticing that with students coming through? Is their education, is it better or worse, do you find? Um, maths, uh, education and maths is going, uh, sorry, the quality in maths is going down yeah. over the recent years and it's, they're trying every, they're trying uh, something new now um, to try to bring the math grades up. I think they're increasing the, the college, but, but the, they're increasing the importance of maths in the Leaving Cert, which is uh, basically the SATs yeah. in Ireland. They're increasing what maths is worth. So if, um, basically in the Leaving Cert, you, your score is converted to points. Okay. And if you get an A, it's 100 points, B is 80 and so on and so on. Yeah. So if, you, if they're saying now, if you get an A, you get more point, you get a lot more points. And then uh, that's, you're, you're, you're competing for places in the university. But I've noticed uh, just in the last two years in university that well, I think it's just biotech, but a lot, a lot of people who are applying for biotechnology don't really seem to have a good handle on maths. Uh, I think that's maybe just because people who are going into biology were, wouldn't be, they, they're going into biology, they don't really, wouldn't really want to handle maths. If they did, they'd be going into physics or chemistry, a much yeah, more mathematic they wanna, base. Want to look look at frogs? Actually, <laughs> yeah. in Sweden, uh, we have a hard time filling the classes in the uh, the on the programs that will give give you a well paid job, and that is largely because the students feel that well, in order to become an engineer or um, a software engineer, I I need to do maths, and that's hard. So I prefer to go study archaeology. <clears throat> um, and I've been looking at this for years, and I'm really, it's really strange to see how little self-preservation instinct they have, the students. But it's, I guess they're, they're 19, and they, they don't really look far into the future and what needs they're going to have when they're 35. Yeah. yeah. For me, it was definitely in school, like, taught mathematics especially. They never taught you how this can be used. Oh, yeah. I do remember. I mean, I, I still do enjoy, like, I'm doing, like, a, a distance learning mathematics degree at the moment. But at the time, it had been explained to me, well, this could be used in designing some kind of laser system or something like that. I think that would have helped a lot, but it was just, you know, endless equations on a blackboard with no real explanation as to why this Almost, so almost like chess problems. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I don't know, was, was that your experience as well, Martin and Marty? Yeah, pretty much. Not, I, I had a very good math teacher, though, so... Um, yeah. 
it worked out anyway. Yeah, I, I had a similar experience, but it wasn't a problem for me that it was chess problems. It was uh, it was fun to to um, yeah. uh, to explore that. And uh, Mrs. Frasian, as, as she was called, she was also an excellent math teacher. Um, so uh, later, I, I've forgotten all the calculus I learned, but, I'm, I've, but I've learned a, a bit about multivariate statistics instead, which is more useful to archaeologists. Oh, well, that's kind of led me in. Like, got a lot of mathematics involved in. More, more stats. Yeah, yeah. You, you need to understand statistics uh, to do to do uh, archaeology, but uh, you don't need calculus or differential calculus. Oh. And that, that's something really strange because. In uh, in high school, uh, I teach high school math, so it's uh, it's uh, very very little statistics, and yeah. almost nothing. We we just mm. basically touch on it and then leave it at that. And that's I, I think that's really sad because it's so important. Uh, I remember the epiphany I had when my friend explained to me why three six-sided dice formed a bell curve and what that meant. Yeah. I, I just sort of hadn't noticed that if you roll three three six-sided dice to, to make a Dungeons and Dragons character, they tend to give you a ten or eleven. Yeah. <laughs> it's so sort of obvious once you find out. Is it true that um, colleges in Sweden uh, it are free, or is that just uh, our colleges? Our uh, universities, <laughs> colleges. Oh, right. Uh, yes. Uh, and anybody can get a, stu a state study loan, which is a very good loan. Uh, I mean, you don't pay a high interest rate on it. But uh, recently we started uh, um, asking for foreign students to pay in Sweden, which they didn't do previously. Uh, but uh, Sweden has this strong uh, ethos of um, meritocracy. And uh, if you're a smart kid from a, from a working class home, then... Uh, pretty much uh, the, the system is open to you. Uh, obviously, there will be cultural barriers, uh, but uh, if, if you're bright and you want to study, then you can do that in Sweden. And we don't have sort of the, the Harvards or the Oxfords or Cambridges um, in Sweden. Uh, there is a difference between the, the older universities and the newer ones, but uh, it's such a tiny place. Sweden has only 9 million people and, and like six or seven big universities. Yeah, and they, they all have pretty much the same thing. There, there are some courses that aren't available in every university, but there's no huge difference. True, and I don't think the, the, the employers will look at your diploma and say, well, he did his, um, his MA in Kalmar, so we're not going to employ him. Yeah, exactly. I was going to ask, uh have you ever seen a, uh, it's a TV show we have in the UK called Time Team? It's an archaeology show. And how do you oh, yeah, it? we love Time Team. That's excellent. Yeah. Uh, taught think, everybody what Geophys is. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, do you think it does a good... The, 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 um, uh, the main guy, he, he died just recently. I'm not talking about Baldrick. I'm talking about <laughs> the, the archaeology professor. Everybody really mourned him. He was... Yeah. Uh, he was uh, well loved, yeah, but um, uh, it hasn't been shown uh, on the air in Sweden, so it tends to be something people pick up on Discovery Channel, I yeah. believe. Yeah. I was just mm. going to say, do you feel that does a good job of uh, presenting archaeology in a good way to the public? Yeah, and everybody is, gets interested in, and uh, knowledgeable, and uh, yeah, it's really good stuff. I wish we had, had something similar. Oh, Actually, yeah. I, People have told me that I should should be Baldrick on a Swedish time team, and I said, <laughs> I, I just always tell them, yeah, sure, just offer me uh, insane amounts of money, and I'll, I'll I'm, <laughs> and I'm your Huckleberry. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, th there was a question here. Uh, what would you say is the basic, broad difference between people in the U.S. and Sweden? Yeah. <laughs> wow. That, that, that's a very big question. Mm. I'm, I wonder who the basic broad is. What's her name? <laughs> <laughs> well, I am. Uh, I am a former. Uh, I grew up in Connecticut, so um, uh, in Sweden you're supposed to be. Uh, you're not supposed to be you know, loud and self-assertive. So uh, since that's something I'm, I suffer from, I, I tell people, well, I'm loud and self-assertive because I'm American, and you're xenophobic when you don't like me. <laughs> um, so that is a uh, difference in the uh, sort of cultural mode that Swedes are traditionally not as uh, loud and uh, 
Uh, another is that uh, Swedes have until recently been completely oblivious to the race issue. Yeah. Um, we didn't have many ideas about people with other skin colors because we, there, there were none. <laughs> but now, obviously, I, I live in an area with 70 nationalities. And uh, uh, around here, I'm, I think um, people are, are behaving really well to each other. It's, uh, it's nice to see the integration. Uh, the second generation immigrants speak excellent Swedish around here and people intermarry and... Um, you can, I like when you run into this Chilean grandmother and the Afghanistani grandmother sitting around in the sun speaking broken Swedish to each other because that's the only language they have in common. Um, but, uh, well, it's a big question and, uh, and uh, I don't know the name of the broad. <laughs> uh, I, I guess one thing is that um, when it comes to the American fake politeness, that's something we don't have. Right, when you like, use uh, people's uh, Christian name all the time. And yeah, I mean, I mean, we call each other by our first names, and we we have a word for sir or ma'am, but we never use it. It's, no, no, that's it, it's archaic. Too, yeah, it's... Con yeah, people did that way back. Mm. You know, uh, when I heard a friend of mine, he was at, uh, at a supermarket in Texas, and when he left the the, um, the check, girl said in a bored tone, missing you already. <laughs> because they had instructed their, their staff to tell uh, the customers yeah. that they were missing them already. Fake um, politeness. Okay, uh, there's a chat room question just came in from Shangori. It's, how is the internet and the amount of misinformation influencing skepticism? I think the, the internet is, is excellent for, for skepticism because we get to, um, to put out information. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> there's a strong feeling among people with uh, sort of um, fringe ideas that there's an unholy alliance between skepticism and Wikipedia which is obviously the, the site with the most hits on the entire internet. But there is no uh, alliance between skepticism and Wikipedia. It's just that Wikipedia and skepticism both follow the scientific method and um, pay attention to scientific credibility. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm an active Wikipedian, and uh, some, every now and then somebody asks me to take a look at uh, an article where, where there's some, someone making funny claims and... Um, uh, no, the internet obviously makes us aware of people with really, really weird ideas. And sometimes you need to remember that it's not worth debating with people who are not going to change their minds when they don't have a platform anyway. Yeah. Uh, on the subject of Wikipedia, that, that's something that, um, yeah, like someone is saying in the chat room now, there's some of my friends claim that Wikipedia cannot be trusted. Uh, I, I like to say that, well, Wikipedia can usually be trusted, but it shouldn't be regarded as an authority on anything. But, but, but Wikipedia it's a, it's a, doesn't claim authority. Exactly. Wikipedia offers um, uh, references. Exactly. Yeah, you, should, you should check the references. Wikipedia is a great starting point. Yeah. yeah. I think it's like a lot of people, yeah, that's what you say, it's a good place to start off. Um, I was and say, a lot of the information there would be impossible to find at all yeah. uh, if it w wasn't on Wikipedia. Yeah. Um, as someone mentioned it there, have you ever seen or read the website Conservapedia? <laughs> yes, I'll take a look. I've looked around the place. It's so easy to troll them because uh, <laughs> if you write something satirical on Conservapedia, the, the usual, regular user will, will take it as, as gospel. Yeah. I think that it's, it, I, f I feel sorry for them. Yeah. And have you, uh, Justin, uh, have you read anything related to your own work on there? Well, just like in archaeology, have you read any crazy archaeology stuff there? On Conservopedia? No, I have not. I guess what might find its way into Conservopedia is uh, radiocarbon denialism. All right. Um, people who want the planet to be 6,000 years old don't like the um, radiocarbon method to date stuff. I mean, just looking at where I am in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, by the time God created the heavens and the earth, people had been hunting seals in the Stockholm area for 2,000 years. <laughs> so um, um, I guess if, if I wanted to find something crazy on Conservative I'd look first at the, the article about radiocarbon dating. Yeah. In my field, because, well, I do electronics, but I work, it's an oil-related thing. Article on oil formation, to the least. 
Ah, uh, does it have a slant that uh, oil will never run out, or? No, it's, it's just how the oil formed. It's the theobatic. Oh, the, the, there was a uh, greater pressure before the flood or something like that? Yeah, and then when the flood oh. happened, it compacted. <laughs> oh, wow. And, like, Scriptural uh, p petrochemics. Yeah, yeah, and basically that oil can form in decades. So we have nothing oh. to worry about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was a question. Uh, yeah, that was stupid. All right. <laughs> sorry, uh, did you have something there, Kitch? Uh, no, 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 sorry. I was, I, I, I'm still just reeling over that um, over that claim. <laughs> All right. Um, there's a question from Durakan. I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. What do you think of the idea of teaching students uh, programming as a way to teach maths and physics? Well, I'm the wrong guy to ask. Yeah. I uh, think that sounds great. All right. Yeah. I actually, one of the things that got me to think math was fun was actually that when I was like 13 or something, I actually, I got my first own PC and I started programming because I had an older friend who had started playing around with Pascal, I think it was. Yeah. And I, I, still th I still think Pascal is the best language. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's well. Yeah, I like C as well, but uh, ah, that's, that's fucking <laughs> ugly. <laughs> oh, it's ugly, yes, but it's the one I've been working the most with. Uh, but but anyway, um, uh, yeah, the, the idea of understanding concepts like variables you can take from programming and apply in math, and it, it yeah, I, I thought that was uh, that was really useful. Uh, when I was growing up, I had a computer as well. I don't know if anyone will know the Amstrad. Or that ring. Oh, there was, yeah, yeah. There was a magazine we got, you got every month, and it had these type-ins, and it was actual programs you could type in yourself. But they broke, yeah. it, they broke it down to explain what each section was doing, and you were able to make, like, you know, the snake game or something like that. And it kind of showed you how, like, um, you know, the mathematics behind it. And so it was quite a... That's, you know, I think in my generation, that's how a lot of people got into maths. It was the computer boom at the time, and I think you know the whole mm. computer at that time. Anyone could program. You could ju you just picked it up and you got a book with your computer, but, but you don't have that now with a PC or such. Yeah, me and my friends it was the Commodore sixty four, where when you switched it on, you were e immediately in inter interpreting BASIC. So yeah. you, um, that was made programming extremely accessible. Yeah. Good stuff. I, I I agree with Martimer that it's uh, it cannot hurt and probably will stimulate anybody to be in, more interested in maths. Yeah, because I think that's what the Raspberry Pi might yeah. be doing right now. If, um, really, isn't it too arcane for the kids? Uh, apparently, in the UK anyway, it's been very very popular here. Oh, because I'm glad the, the, because it can connect to the internet. And one of the things I've seen that one kid managed to do was. He managed to program it so, and he took it to a racetrack, like where they were having horse racing, and he'd written a program where it could update, like with the uh, odds for betting on the horses. And I think there's a lot of uh, co they have competitions in the schools to see what the kids can come up with using the Raspberry Pi. Good stuff. Yeah. Uh, like there was something someone was saying there, which I that from, and that was they were saying that uh, science has a liberal bias, which I said it does, because. And I think what they were trying to get at was like, you know, the conservatives seem to deny science. There's, a, there's still plenty of it on the liberal side, I find. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah, di different issues, basically, yeah. isn't it? I mean, science is just neutral, really. It's got a, it doesn't have any bias as such. Yeah, yeah it's not a political thing, so. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, Marty or Kitch, do you have any questions here? I'll check the chat room and see what they're saying. Let's see. I um. Oh, okay. I, I'll just get to this because so, someone asked before, and uh, and I have a related question about pseudo archaeology, the whole Atlantis thing, uh, which I'm sure you're sick of. <laughs> uh, I also happen to be sick of it because I've been dealing with New Agers who who have been uh, talking about that and. Uh, do, do you know how this whole thing started and how, you know, where, where the story comes from, what... Um... 
Uh, I find that the yeah. New Agers are surprisingly poorly read. They usually yeah. only know about Atlantis from sort of New Age treatments yeah. of it. Exactly. So th they've never read Plato. Yeah, because that, and, that's, uh, that's, where, that, that's the earliest mention of it that I have been able to find. But someone... Well, it, someone it is the earliest mention. Yeah, thank you. But what he says is that this is stuff that I got from Solon, and Solon got it from uh, priests yeah. in, um, in Egypt. Right. But, Anonymous uh, priests. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and uh, Solon is a real guy, uh, but the work where he possibly mentioned Atlantis uh, hasn't survived, and nobody knows about the Egyptian priests. There's nothing in uh, Egyptian literature, ancient Egyptian exactly. literature, that uh, uh, tallies with Atlantis. And uh, it's, um, it's not important to Plato whether it's real or not. He's using it as um, uh, sort of a model... Uh, society when he's talking about the ideal state. Exactly. So, of course, he will. I, I just for the, just to mention it. I did read uh, Critias and Timaeus, the part the parts of it that are actually available. So. Oh, well done. That's more more than uh, than most people have done. There's a new translation of, of Plato uh, by, into Swedish. Oh, cool. Yeah. No. Uh, there's a funny uh, connection to Sweden. We in the 17th century, Sweden was a very sudden uh, major political player on, on European stage for a brief while, and they needed sort of national. Uh, professor at Uppsala wrote an enormous book. Of everything pretty much started in Sweden, and uh, uh, he said that well, what Plato is describing is really ancient Sweden, and he, he pointed. <laughs> To, to, for instance, there's a village on Gotland, this island in the Baltic, named Atlingbo, and ATL Atlingbo, Atlantis. <laughs> <laughs> it's plain to see. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, I'm I'm currently uh, finishing the 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 old um, um, trippy '70s conspiracy book series of, the, of uh, Illuminatus. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, of Atlantic lore in there, so it's uh, it's good fun for fiction. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, if you uh, if you visit a New Age uh, fair in Sweden, uh, you will uh, run into endless uh, Atlantean dolphin jewelry and stuff like yeah. that. Uh, so, uh, are you, are you familiar with the claims about the thirteen uh, emerald tablets? I haven't read those. No, it sounds like something out of H.P. Lovecraft. Uh, yeah, what's on them? Pretty much. Uh, I don't. I don't remember. It was some some weird cultish guy who claims that some uh, uh, king of Atlantis uh, came to him in a vision and whatever. Uh, it just gets dumber from there. Is this Joseph Smith? <laughs> no, I I don't remember his I name. I think his tablets were golden. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I I can't remember. So some people are suggesting stuff in the chat room, and it doesn't ring a bell. It's not Melchizedek. Uh, it's more recent. Uh, ah, whatever. Screw it. Yeah. The thing is, that's not the worst part of what you're having to deal. With. Oh no, 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 no. no. But but that's a funny thing about how people look. At who will uh, want those thirteen emerald tablets or golden tablets or whatever with writing on them? Yeah. Uh, because. That's sort of how they believe that you get uh, information about the past. Whereas, right. I'm a prehistorian. The, the people I studied didn't read or write at all. So, um, uh, to me, uh, written matter is usually not relevant unless I'm looking at the Viking period, basically, when when people outside of Sweden start writing about Sweden. Uh, so, um, a lot of people they uh, they get a bit disappointed when they come to prehistoric archaeology and it's all types of pottery and uh, flaked flint implements and yeah. <clears throat> instead of giving them names and wars and battles and stuff we'll tell them that well yeah and then there was an ex increased influence from Denmark <laughs> we can see that in the pottery decoration <laughs> and it will yeah. go yawn yeah. no I'm going to go watch Stargate <laughs> okay um, there was a uh, general one, just are you a Lovecraft fan? Oh, yeah, I love Lovecraft. I, I, I reread uh, one big chunk of him this, just this past summer. All right. And the question was uh, the 9 11 truth movement. Does that have any kind of voice in Sweden? 
Uh, I think I've seen it mentioned once or twice in really fringe um, uh, fringe situations, but uh, to to Swedes, nine uh, eleven is not a defining moment. It's, uh, we're not. We, I mean, we are Americanized, but that, not that Americanized. Yeah, it does come up quite a bit here in the UK. Mm -hmm. In fact, I know a friend of mine and his brother actually went round. He lives in some small village in Scotland. He was going up on the telegraph poles, putting up 9-11 was an inside job on them. In, this <laughs> village, in a village of 200 people, I don't know what he thought he was going to achieve. Uh, it's a bit like taking a stand in the conflict between Crips and Bloods in, um, in a small Scottish village. Maybe. Yeah. Uh, but I guess he wanted the sheeple to wake up or something like that. I have no idea what he, his idea was. Uh, Marty, there's that question. I don't know. If, is that a read question or something? <laughs> I don't know. What? The last question you'll see in the Skype chat. Oh, Skype chat, sorry. Yeah. I've uh, fallen behind there. Oh, uh, yeah, there's whose a, birds are chirping in the background? That, that would be, be mine. Yep. Are, are they uh, budgies or what? Yeah. Mm. Um, I, okay. I used to keep, keep budgies when I was a kid. They're okay. nice. Yeah, I think Marty's. They, they, they just can't shut up. Yeah. Mm. That's, that's my problem with them. Uh, okay, <laughs> someone. Someone is asking, "What are you wearing?" <laughs> <laughs> a leather bikini. <laughs> no, I'm I'm wearing Red Sonia's chainmail bikini right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was. Someone said that, uh, what about just conspiracy theories in general? Is that something you've come across with the Skeptics Association? Oh, yeah. Conspiracy theories are uh, directly linked to mental illness because uh, if you are borderline psychotic, you will uh, sort of have a... a um, uh, your agency-seeking faculties will be working uh, overtime in your head. and You will try, uh, ever see everything to be meaningful and intended by someone. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you get a lot of um, uh, conspiracy theories on the uh, fringier side of things. Uh, we, we always joke about it in the Swedish skeptics, how, how we've, uh, we're obviously agents of the Illuminati. And uh, uh, at one time, we were both Nazis and controlled by the Labour Party, according to, <laughs> <laughs> to, to various movements. Yeah. I've, I've noticed that it's, it's not just uh, the mentally ill, but also people who aren't particularly bright in general. There's this, uh, um, when I was studying pedagogy, uh, I, I was taught about this thing I believe it was called hostile interpretation bias, mm -hmm. uh, where you essentially, uh, it, it's especially true with, with kids uh, that they will you know, if someone bumps into you from behind, he pushed you. It wasn't that he tripped and fell. It must. And this have been is something everybody you. has, or no? It's very common among children. Yes. That, that you you assume that something is intentional if it's bad. All oh, right. Yes. And uh, this is something that people tend to grow out of, but. People who are, shall we say, uh, to use the politically incorrect term, stupid, don't actually grow out of this. But it's a larger issue too. I mean, that brings in religion, where uh, yeah. religious people have a feeling that everything is sort of b being monitored by the big guy in the sky, and uh, no exactly. sparrow sparrow falls to the ground without him noticing and stuff like that. Yeah. Whereas, uh, as one of these sort of Lovecraftian mechanistic poor sods, we just feel that shit happens, and yeah. uh, a lot of it is happening all the time. Do you want to come in with something there? I'm quiet again. Ah, sir, um, is there other, is there, are, there, are there people out there who believe in other uh, mystical cities or fictitious cities, such as Atlantis? Or is it just Atlantis is the biggest, um, the biggest... Well, there uh, used to be the hunt for El Dorado story. Okay. Uh, El Dorado in Spanish means the the uh, the gilded one, the gilded man, 
there was this story back in the 16th century about uh, uh, a civilization of Indians somewhere in South America where they would they would gild their king with uh, gold dust uh, for, for festivals and, they, and he would swim in a, so, a sacred lake and all the gold dust would sort of wash off him and end up at, at the bottom of the lake. And a lot of the <clears throat> early uh, conquistador incursions into South America was motivated by the search for this uh, fabulous place, sort of Shangri-La, where people were wading in gold. Um, but uh, as far as I know, no, um, nobody has been able to find El Dorado in Sweden yet, but uh, I wouldn't put it past them. <laughs> uh, question there, now it's gone. Sorry, there was something related to that. Uh, Marty, can you take over? I try and remember what I was going to say there. Mm. Oh, so it was related to archaeology. Hey, uh, hey, I have a question. Yeah, sure. uh, the the sure. podcast logo seems to be Thor's hammer, is it? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's a modified version of it. Yeah, so um, is anybody uh, on, in the group a neo-pagan? Nope. <laughs> no. no. Uh, it, it's just, uh, we, we're bringing the hammer down on stupidity, and I suggested that if we're going to do a hammer, let's, let's do a... a proper hammer. <laughs> yeah. That's, that, that's, that's excellent. Yeah, I, I have some, uh, some religious friends. They're not very religious, but they, they identify as Christians. And I also have a friend, Eddie the neo-pagan goldsmith. He's a, he's, a, he's a member of my gaming group, and uh, he's also a big uh, martial arts instructor and Star Wars fan, just all-around lovely guy. And um, he uh, sacrifices bacon uh, in the woods, uh, and um, uh, I think he um, gives his, his girlfriend one or two, which is also part of his pagan outlook. Uh, but uh, I have to explain to people all the time that I don't find new religions sillier than the old ones, just that they're newer. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. the, the precepts of Babylonian um, polytheism are really silly, but it's a very old religion. <laughs> um, sorry, there was, so sorry, I've got the basically, the, the respect a, um, a faith will be um, given is um, uh, proportional to its political clout. The question I had was, have you seen or are you aware of the film Zeitgeist? Yeah, isn't that one of those 9-11 truther things? Part of it is, but part of it deals with... Uh, Marty, have you seen it? Yeah, uh, yeah, I started watching Rage Quit after about a couple of seconds. Uh, yeah. it, it's uh, basically some idea about how um, Christianity is a huge conspiracy as well, I think. Yeah, All right. Uh, they're they're trying to present themselves as being skeptical, like you know they're they're taking a skeptical look at Christianity, and then they basically say, "I don't remember what it is they actually propose, but it's something just uh, it equally was, unfounded." Uh, Christianity was based on astrology and the Egyptian religions, or something. Yeah, and I, I think I think. There's some truth to that, and that. Well, uh, would that make it elements. less believable? I, I just, yeah, I don't. exactly. <laughs> yeah, there are elements of uh, of uh, other religions found in Christianity, but I mean, uh, th that doesn't imply that it's an intentional conspiracy to do whatever. But a lot of uh, uh, criticism against Christianity. People keep rehashing stuff that was discovered in the early 19th century as if this was something really new that, yeah. hey, we've discovered that there were several writers behind the, uh, behind the Old Testament. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've moved on. Okay, um, See, so on that note, have you had to deal much with, it's something I, like we get quite a lot on YouTube now and it's from the Muslims about the scientific knowledge of the Quran. That's something you've had to deal with at all. Well, I've heard it mentioned, but um, um, I know that, that that is something you will be told from the pulpit in, in mosques. That, but it's sort of, sort of a general, part of a general high valuation of the Quran. That the Quran is great. It's the foundation of our faith. He's, here are all the ways in which the Quran is great. Oh, and by the way, it also predicted atomic power. Yeah, I've, the one I keep hearing is it. Well, it's yeah, which they don't even believe in. Yes. No, <laughs> yes. 
in in a in a Lutheran context, it's really silly to be looking for um, uh, for science in the scriptures, as some people do, because Lutheranism is all about believing without proof. So, if you're looking for proof, then you are a bad Lutheran. Yeah, yeah. And it always always turns out that. Um, Oh, we found, we uh, discovered the theory and then the Bible is uh, used to say, oh, but we predicted that. Yeah, okay. yeah. We, we <laughs> just realized that we predicted that. <laughs> it's it's like Nostradamus. Um, Nostradamus <laughs> has never been able to predict anything beforehand, but you can always read stuff into him. Yeah, yeah that's uh, one thing like, well, I told you before the show, I grew up in the Outer Hebrides and the Shalch big legend of a prophet up there that a lot of people, including some very close relatives of mine, they take extremely seriously. A Christian prophet? N just a prophet, that's all. It's not necessarily Christian. It's not tied into that. And because um, I lived on an island and like there was the boat that would go to the mainland. And apparently there was some prophecy saying that, uh, you know, because the island is called Lewis, the Isle of Lewis shall say, or a great disaster shall befall the Isle of Lewis. And the only survivor will be uh, a woman wearing red shoes and a woman with a Bible. And then we got a new boat about 10 years ago, and it was called the Isle of Lewis. And I remember, I was like the first two weeks, nearly every woman that went on that boat had red shoes on. And wow! Yeah, it's <laughs> that's just great. That's how seriously it was taken. And Yeah, but you know, talk about self-fulfilling prophecy. And then like there was, and it so happened on the, on the, on the sailing I was on, uh, this woman was, and there was a nun on board, and everyone crowded around. <laughs> everyone was staying close to her just in case the boat sank. But that's funny how they were interpreting the prophecy to be really sort of uh, literalist stickler sort of thing. That, yeah. Well, maybe they, they were referring to the boat and not to the island. Yeah, but and there was another prophecy he made, like it was about Inverness, that when five rivers, no, when five bridges cross the river, that there'll be a great disaster in the world, and the fifth bridge was built in 1939. And then, oh, oh, what happened? That's the great disaster. So, oh, but, then well, I looked, they but then I looked it up and there's no actual evidence this guy even existed. <laughs> well, uh, if you look at modern psychics, they will uh, often uh, yeah. retrofit their um, uh, predictions after the fact. So I mean, you need to put yeah. the, their mm. websites into the Wayback Machine. I mean, I've had that like when I go home and had you know, debates with some of my relatives and I've told them, look, what about all these other predictions he got? Got these right? That there's got to be something <laughs> to this. What about you know? They always say, but what about the ones he got right? And they say, well, how many <laughs> did he get wrong? And there's like a big stack of things that just haven't happened yet. It would be very helpful if you could identify the real ones before. <laughs> <laughs> if you keep on making predictions, you're bound to get some slightly correct if you're willing to to bend oh, yeah. what you say. Yeah. 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 Um, just, as long as you've got um, a, a willing believer. Yeah. That's just, it's taken hold so much. Like, if you ever visit the island, there's people who gladly tell you about it. Because, like, I know in my family, they were great believers in second sight and prophecy and all. Like my, well, not uh, my immediate, but like a few generations back. I hear the Icelanders are pretty big on that too. They believe both in traditional uh, pixies and in uh, spirit mediums and stuff like that. So they, they seem to be pretty strange in their beliefs. Yeah, um, oh, and did you know about, there was this belief in the 19th century that, uh, that there would be um, surviving traditions of uh, old poetry and stuff, uh, particularly on Aaron, isn't that one of the uh, Outer Hebrides? Uh, or is that one of the... Aaron's uh, the Inner Hebrides. On Facebook. Okay, well, so folklorists were going there and, and interviewing everybody above the age of 60 and trying to find these uh, legendary tradition carriers, and they, they never did, sadly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we are coming up for the last five minutes. So, and here well, we've got one. Someone managed to get a question in for the end. Are there any pagan religions and beliefs that survived the Christianization of Europe? Um, well, to this day, Swedes don't really like to eat horse meat, horse flesh. And that is, is weird because there's no sort of scriptural uh, ban on that at all. But we know that eating horse flesh was a very important part of pagan cult. So uh, in order 
after the winter, you needed to, to sacrifice horses and the king would ceremonially cook horse flesh and, and feed his uh, close circle. And uh, probably that's part uh, of a, uh, an old um, tradition from Christianization that you need to quit eating horse flesh. And that we still don't like doing that in Sweden. But uh, I don't know anywhere in Europe where a pagan cult has survived. You get a long period where sort of folklore survives, um, but is different from um, uh, the, the old uh, real paganism. Yeah. For instance, a friend of mine told me that traditional Sami uh, ritual singing, it's called yoiking, there was this hope in the 19th century that if we, uh, if we got down the lyrics for all the yoiks, we will find uh, remnants of Sami paganism. It turned out that they were yoiking lyrics from the Swedish um, uh, church's official hymnal of the late 17th century. There was nothing left of their traditional beliefs in the yoik. Okay. Uh, but then, then you have all these uh, these ideas. Like, there's someone saying now that there are still pagan groups in Denmark, Sweden, and Norway. Uh, and well, yeah, but they, they aren't groups that have survived, as far as I understand it. Yeah. It's more like people who have uh, started taking an interest in ancient beliefs, and they're sort of taking bits and pieces of it and uh, sort of. Yeah, recreating that, it and it's probably all, it's neo-paganism yeah, like yeah. my my friend who, who sacrifices bacon uh, they, yeah. they tend to use Snorri Sturluson a Christian writer of the 13th yeah. century as their holy uh, scripture yeah uh, the Edda yes that isn't actually the Viking Bible although it's often thought of that way but it, it was so it was a it religious was a, poetry surviving, but there's no religious cult surviving. So nobody knows how to perform Viking period cults correctly. Right. All right, we've got two minutes left now. So uh, what we usually do is we allow our guests to have a self regulation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You can get up on your soapbox now. If there's anything you want to promote, yeah. go ahead. I was pleased to hear uh, the last with the, the uh, lady from ERV. Yeah. Um, she's on science blogs and so am I. So if, if you want to read about archaeology, uh, you can follow my blog at scienceblogs.com slash aardvarchaeology. Right. Uh, you'll find it. And also, uh, if you're in, in any way um, capable of reading Scandinavian languages, uh, go to vof.se. Uh, that's our, uh, the Swedish Skeptics website where we've got uh, an enormous archive of stuff from our quarterly journal. It's been uh, appearing since the 80s, so we've, we've got a lot of stuff there covered. And I just take it you cover absolutely any subject, any and every subject you can. Well, yeah, anything that can be approached um, uh, scientifically. So uh, yeah. you won't find articles about whether Jesus loves all the children or not. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you very much, Martin. It's been fantastic. Uh, yeah, really thanks, guys. It's been great. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's been great. Okay, and uh, just very quick, a very reduced panel this week. So just go around for your final thoughts. Uh, Kit, you've been very quiet again. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I, I don't know really too much about Sweden, but it was very interesting to hear about uh, skepticism in Sweden and the problems you guys have and probably the best, the, the advantages you guys have as well in terms of religion I would definitely be a country you've definitely convinced me that if I ever have to move anywhere it'd be Sweden yeah and, it's uh, a good, yeah, good and place it great. but uh, it's way during the winters it's dark and nasty and cold <laughs> I'm used to cold but uh, thanks for coming on it's oh. been brilliant okay. thank you uh, Marty yeah I know uh, quite a bit about Sweden but uh, <laughs> I don't know much about archaeology so it's it has been interesting. Unfortunately, I, if I knew a little bit more than I do, I could have had more interesting questions, I guess. Yeah, but it's been good for you to have a fellow countryman on. Yeah. Don't be too hard on yourself. Are, are you a member of EOF? <laughs> no, I'm not. I actually uh, didn't really know much about it. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, why, would, why don't you add me on Facebook and Twitter? Uh, I don't have Twitter, but I'll, I'll add you on Facebook. Thanks, man. All right, uh, thank you very much, everyone. Uh, just to let you all know, there's no show next week as I'm due in for some surgery, just something minor, but we'll be oh. we'll be back in two weeks and it's going to be the live ponies will be making a return. And 
I think, Marty, have you seen the target for the live pony? Have you seen anything of it? I'm not sure. It's the privileged planet. No, I have not seen and it. It's made was, by was that the, the site you showed me about... Uh, was it birds can fly, therefore God did it, or something like that? Yeah, that's, that's one of the documentaries they have. Oh, it's crap. basically it's the it's the Discovery Institute. It's the makers. Just look at oh. the banana. Basically, it's the Discovery. it's the makers of that Lee Strobel. Yeah, we watched. That sounds like a lot of fun. Yes. Mm. So everyone, so gather round. And also, we were scheduled next week to have Karen Stolzen on the show, but we will be rearranging that due to me having to go to hospital. So. Anyway, everyone, thank you very much for tuning in and hope you all have a great rest of the weekend, wherever you are. And we'll see you in two weeks. Good night, everyone. Bye. 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 B